Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for a unique collaboration between two leading nonpartisan nonprofit research and policy institution, the Washington-based Brookings Institution and the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv. My name is Shira Efron, and I'm a visiting research fellow at the INSS and have the honor of moderating the discussion today with our distinguished experts from both institutions. Today's topic is also unique, uh, with a focus on North Korea and the Middle East. Um, you know, here in the Middle East, we rarely think of North Korea as an important actor. But uh, actually, North Korea has been active in the region for decades. Uh, it has sold weapons, collaborated with different countries uh, on military technology, uh, as, and assisted Syria and Libya with, the, with their nuclear programs. It's clear that from North Korea's end, the Middle East provides a source of uh, revenue and uh, alliances and international ties. But beyond revenue and ties, what does North Korea leader Kim Jong-un want in the Middle East? What kind of impact North Korea has had in the region? How has the North Korean nuclear experience informed Iran's efforts in that area? And what is common and different between the counterproliferation strategies against North Korea and Iran? To address these and other questions, I can't think of a better group of experts than those with us today. I'll introduce them briefly and transition over to them for opening remarks and subsequently a discussion. And we encourage audience questions, of course. So starting with Dr. Jung Pak, uh, is a senior fellow um, and the SK Korea Foundation Chair in Korea Studies at Brookings. Um, she's the author of a very new book, uh, Becoming Kim, Kim Jong-un, a former CIA's officer insight into North Korea's enigmatic young dictator. Um, as the title of her book suggests, she was previously at CIA and held, held senior positions also at the Office of Director of National Intelligence. Um, Seema Shine is a senior research fellow at INSS. For most of her career, she served in the Israeli intelligence community, and her last position was head of uh, research and evaluation division in the Mossad. Um, after her retirement from Mossad, Shine served as deputy head of strategic affairs in Israel's National Security Council, and then in the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, where she was uh, deputy director and in charge of the Iran file. And I think, uh, clearly, Sima is by far one of Israel's most important experts and voices on the Iran Iranian topic. Um, Bob Einhorn, um, there's a very long and distinguished career, I'll try to be brief. He's a senior fellow at Brookings. He fo focuses on arms control, non-proliferation, and regional security issues. Um, before joining Brookings in 2013, uh, Bob served in the US Department of State. He was a special advisor for non-proliferation and arms control, which led him to play a leading role in the formulation and execution of US policy toward Iran's nuclear program. Um, he's held several um, administration, uh, uh, governmental positions uh, before and worked in other think tanks in Washington. And finally, last but not least, Major General Amos Yavin is the executive director of INSS. He served in the IDF for 40 years, uh, including as the chief of military intelligence between 2006 and 2010. Uh, I'm mentioning the years because they're relevant for our discussion. Under his leadership, the IDF hit the cube near uh, Deir al-Azhar in Syria in 2007, shortly before it became an active nuclear reactor. Um, Amos also brings a different uh, pr practitioner uh, experience. He accumulated over 5,000 flight hours and flew more than 250 combat missions beh behind enemy lines, uh, including in the Yom Kippur War, the First Lebanon War, and the destruction of the Ozir nuclear reactor in Iraq in 18 1981. Uh, Amos will conclude uh, the discussion in the end and provide his insight. Uh, Jung, Sima, Bob, Thank you for joining us. Jung, let's start with you. You recently wrote a book and an article in Foreign Affairs uh, entitled, What Kim Wants. So what does he want in general? And in particular, what does he want in the Middle East? Well, thank you. Um, thanks to INSS and, and for Brookings for putting this together. I'm really so pleased to be with my, uh, my colleague, Bob, and, and to be with you, uh, Ms. Shine and Major General Yadlin. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about what Kim wants from the Middle East, uh, but I want to take a big picture first of what, why Kim has nuclear weapons in the first place. Um, North Korea has developed nuclear weapons for deterrence, course of diplomacy, and strategic relevance and prestige. A country founder, Kim Il-sung, first entertained the idea in the 1960s, and his son, Kim Jong-il, developed them and bestowed a fledgling nuclear program to the current leader, Kim Jong-un. 
PIM 3.0 has accelerated the country's nuclear weapons program, embedded them into the constitution, further entrenching them into North, the North's and his own identity and brand. Kim Jong-un has conducted four of the North's six nuclear tests and expanded the size and sophistication of his ballistic missile forces from short range to intercontinental range to those launched from sea-based platforms. Kim has also tested four times more missiles than his grandfather and father combined. The North Korean bombs are now much more powerful as well. The last test in September of 2017 was about 10 times bigger than the one dropped uh, by the United States on Hiroshima in 1945. So put together, these nuclear weapons, the missiles especially, are now more diverse in their ranges. They're more mobile, more reliable, and more dangerous. And the regime aims to ensure that it has preemptive and second strike survivable capabilities. Kim has matched these demonstrations with muscular rhetoric. The regime has threatened to attack South Korea, uh, has also threatened a preemptive nuclear attack against the United States, declared the Korean War armistice uh, null and void, and engaged in a war of words with uh, the US President Donald Trump in 2017 that sparked fears about a military conflict spiraling into a nuclear conflagration. Despite these threats and these demonstrations, the regime has claimed, as it has over uh, many years, that it will be a responsible nuclear weapons power. Kim, in his 2018 New Year's speech, declared, quote, our republic will not use nuclear weapons unless its sovereignty is encroached upon by any aggressive hostile forces with nukes, so essentially a defensive uh, me measure. The summits of 2018 and 2019, three meetings with President Trump, five with Xi Jinping, three with Moon Jae-in of South Korea, and one with Vladimir Putin, supported Kim's desire to be seen as a respectable statesman. Yet summit diplomacy and the legitimacy it garnered for Kim eclipsed the reason for why North Korea has been shunned and sanctioned by the international community in the first place. Um, these sanctions have been put in place to prevent the transfer of we uh, knowledge of we uh, weapons of mass destruction and materials from transiting into and out of North Korea and to choke the financial avenues that fund these programs. These include bans on trade of North Korean arms and military equipment, dual use technologies and machinery, and the freezing of assets of key actors involved in the nuclear weapons and ballistic missile program. The counter proliferation sanctions are critical to slowing not just North Korea's weapons programs, but also that of other actors, including states in the Middle East. Pyongyang has a long history of, uh, of long history of military cooperation in the Middle East and North Africa, including partners like Iran, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, and Yemen, with ties to Iran and Syria being the strong among the strongest and the most enduring. But these relationships are transactional rather than strategic or broad-based and are driven primarily by Pyongyang's desire to generate and maintain revenue streams diversify their ties to the outside world, amplify their course of diplomacy, and facilitate North Korean illicit activities in a relatively permissive environment. The Syria relationship goes back to the days of Kim Il-sung in the 1960s when the two countries sought each other out in their common struggle against the imperialist West. North Korea also supplied men and materiel to support Syria in the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War. In the 1990s and into the 2000s, the US government assessments indicated that Syria and North Korea had expanded cooperation, including on missile production technologies. A declassified CIA document from 1995 indicated that Syria's copies of Soviet-designed Scud missiles are present throughout the Middle East, including Syria and Iran. The cooperation also included the building of a nuclear reactor, which I, I know my colleagues will be following up with and will uh, describing in greater detail. Ties to Iran date from 1973 when the two countries established diplomatic ties with their shared view of the world as a hostile place. The heyday of cooperation in, with Tehran was in the 1980s and the 1990s as Iran looked for cheap weapons, missiles, and training 
as it fought its wars against the rock, and while North Korea looked to improve its access to energy sources after losing cheap oil from the Soviet Union. Other than the nuclear reactor that was destroyed by Israel in 2007, U.S. government assessments have maintained for years that there is no credible evidence of nuclear cooperation between North Korea and Syria and North Korea and Iran or other actors in the Middle East. And even ballistic missile cooperation has petered out over the years uh, as countries' needs have been met by indigenized expertise through reverse engineering or other sources of arms. The Director of National Intelligence, my former boss, James Clapper, told the Senate Armed Services Committee in 2016, of late, there has not been a great deal of interchange between Iran and North Korea. Two years earlier, he had testified that Iran is not currently receiving assistance with its ICBM program. Since 2013, the Department of Defense reports to Congress have echoed similar assessments. Competition from cheap but better, more advanced material from China is also probably hampering a more lucrative and robust relationship. From 2013 to 2017, China was the world's fourth largest arms supplier, selling military equipment worth more than $10 billion to the Middle East. But all of this does not mean that we should relax our vigilance. In fact, you can make the argument that it was our vigilance and our worries and concerns about cooperation that has led to the petering, it has uh, contributed a large part to the petering out of this relationship. A 2018 United Nations report gave new information about cargo from two years earlier in 2016. North Korea was reportedly carrying 30,000 rocket-propelled grenades worth $26 million to Egypt's main weapons conglomerate. A New York Times report highlighted how Cairo is a bustling arms bazaar for covert sales of North Korean missiles and military hardware across the region. Another uh, UN report from February of 2008 said North Korea shipping is shipping supplies to Syria that could be used in the production of chemical weapons that included acid-resistant tiles, valves, and thermometers. And North Korean missile technicians have been spotted working in known chemical weapons and missile facilities inside Syria. Uh, and the, the UN report also uh, noted that there have been 40 previously unreported shipments of missile parts and missiles and materials. In, 2000, in, May, uh, in March of 2019, the UN panel of exports uh, experts reported that uh, two uh, designated North Korean arms entities, uh, Comid and Green Pine, were extremely active in Iran. There have been, and that there were active investigations into who is at, who is exactly at the North Korean embassy undercover in Tehran, uh, and that two North Korean reps were monitored flying between Tehran and Dubai more than 262 times between 2014 and 2016, according to another UN account. In 2016, the U.S. Treasury Department designated uh, Iranian officials for engaging in ballistic missile procurement in collaboration with sanctioned North Korean entities. The 2019 Annual Threat Assessment, which the DNI delivers uh, to Congress, Iran is, currently, is not currently undertaking key nuclear weapons development activities necessary to produce the nuclear device. <laughs> But its officials have publicly threatened to resume nuclear activities, uh, and the regime is probably maintaining the option of, of uh, uh, start these activities. Going forward, we're likely to see continued North Korean attempts to sell weapons and, and potentially nuclear weapons. And the key factor is, uh, will the North Koreans get away with it? Uh, uh, Secre uh, the Director of National Intelligence Clapper, as well as the Secretary of Defense, have all expressed awareness of the possibilities of these uh, increased cooperation and possible uh, uh, transfer of nuclear technologies. And so this is all, will always be a key concern. And given the uh, coronavirus lockdown and the border lockdowns in North Korea, as well as uh, the uh, ongoing economic uh, stressors as a result of sanctions placed on North Korea, uh, the North Korean uh, government is likely to continue to try to drum up business in the Middle East. Um, and and I, would assess, I would assess that if nuclear uh, components, which would be at a different level of pro provocative actions um, in these transfers of technology, bombs, or knowledge, um, these, the North Koreans will probably prefer to uh, deal with trusted 
long established partners uh, rather than to uh, non state or unknown uh, actors. Um, so let me stop there um, and turn it over to you, back to you, Shira. Sima, um, based on what we heard, and I think uh, the big picture from Pyongyang, um, it's very hard not to uh, uh, try to compare between the Iranian and the North uh, Korean cases. What are the similarities? What are the differences? And, um, and what lessons, possibly, in your assessment, did Iran, has Iran learned from the North Korea case? Thank you, Shira. Um, as was mentioned before, let me uh, say some words uh, as the background for the relations between these, country, these two countries, Iran and uh, North Korea, and uh, then uh, something, how, how does Iran look upon the example of the North Korean uh, affair with the US, uh, the nuclear issue, how it protected it or, uh, and brought Trump to enter into the territory of North Korea. So first of all, uh, let me uh, remind, as you have mentioned, John, before, that the ties, the military ties between Iran and North Korea are ongoing for many, many years. Uh, they were concentrated on the, uh, specifically on the nuclear, uh, on the uh, missile um, uh, technology. Uh, and uh, uh, in the response, uh, Iran was paying sometimes in cash, but most of the time with uh, oil. Um, we didn't know, and uh, as, as was mentioned before, uh, there were uh, a big question marks whether there is uh, uh, any cooperation in the nuclear field. Um, we don't know exactly. Uh, we could suspect, but there is uh, one major difference. If we uh, try to compare Syria and the, North, and the Iran, uh, there is a one major difference. Syria was, uh, needed uh, North Korea to build for her the nuclear reactor. Iran uh, is, uh, doesn't need any such support from North Korea. It is a country that uh, uh, was uh, building its own nuclear reactor according to Russian uh, uh, blueprints, but they were doing it on their own. Uh, but of course, there might have been an interest in Iran in a different kind, a different information in enrichment, in specifically in uh, testings, and there were from time to time uh, there was an information suggesting that Iranian uh, officials were participating in nuclear uh, um, nuclear um, uh, attempts that uh, in uh, in ex exercises that were done in uh, North Korea. We don't have, as far as I know, a, a confirmation for these reports but they suggest that Iran wanted to see how it is conducted uh, because Iran uh, is not there any uh, is not there was not there and is not there yet now now uh, as i said the, uh, when they, when they, we compare syria and iran syria wanted a turnkey project from north korea and the koreans were doing it in syria in a secret way a group of uh, technicians were building under the ground this reactor Iran uh, always wanted to do the things on its own, not to be dependent on any, anyone from the outside. Now, in the past, we believed that there are limits on the proliferation of North Korea. They needed this desperately money, support, the economic support, but th there, there were limits. Probably there were limits. That was the belief on the, in the intelligence community, uh, in most of the intelligence communities all over the world. Uh, missiles were known, the co cooperation on missiles were known, and other arms, but nuclear was something that was, uh, um, was believed to be uh, out of, uh, uh, of the cooperation between Iran and uh, between North Korea and Iran, or Syria, Libya, and others. Of course, the case of the Syrian reactor uh, proved that there is no limitations on the side of North Korea. The desire to have uh, uh, money and economic support, if it's oil or, or, or food, is uh, beyond uh, any limitations. And therefore, uh, today we should look upon North Korea as a, a country that will sell, if it's needed, any technology that is relevant as well to the nuclear realm. Um, I want to say about Iran, the, if we look on the, on, on, on the past relations of the last decade, uh, there were two very interesting uh, visits of uh, high-ranking uh, North Korean uh, 
a politician, uh, uh, the same one in 2012 and in 2017. Uh, in 2012, he it was the head of the uh, judiciary system. Uh, he was uh, is believed to be the second in the, in the political hierarchy, and uh, um, and he uh, signed a technical a scientific agreement with Iran that is very similar to the agreement that was signed with Syria and was the background for the uh, nuclear uh, reactor that was built by North Korea in uh, Syria. Um, now, uh, the, the, the common knowledge, I would say, in the world is to believe that when Iran is looking upon the case of North Korea, the main conclusion that it draws is that uh, since North Korea has succeeded to have nuclear weapons and demonstrating, demonstrated its, uh, its uh, capabilities, uh, this is the ultimate secure card for the regime uh, for, the, for, the, for his future. And uh, what, is, uh, what is believed to be is that when Iran is looking for North Korea, they, be, they would prefer to be in the same situation. But Iran is not there. Iran doesn't have nuclear capabilities. Still doesn't have nuclear military capabilities. And probably is not very close to that. Might get in the future, but it's not very close now. So if we are looking on the three last decades of Iranian behavior in the realm of, of their uh, uh, nuclear program, one would say that before Iran there stood two models, possi possible models. One is the Japanese model, the other one is the North Korean model. The Japanese model means getting all the, uh, all the uh, aspects of the nuclear uh, cycle, and the knowledge how to have a nuclear device uh, and getting to the position, to the political position of a, the technical position to, of a threshold, nuclear threshold state, and, and leaving the decision to the time when it comes. The decision to break out and to have a nuclear device or to stay as a threshold country. The other one was the, the, the North Korean model, which meant a breakout to military capability, nuclear capability, uh, alienating the international community, leaving the, N, uh, the, NMP, uh, the NPT uh, convention, and uh, being willing to sacrifice the short time that was needed in order to get uh, to, the first, uh, to the first device. Now, when, uh, when, Iran, uh, when I'm looking on Iran and, and uh, on its policies, I would say, and some Iranians have even, even uh, uh, expressed it, they decided to go on the, Chinese, uh, on the Jap Japanese model. Uh, Iran was, uh, was promoting its nuclear program as a civilian program, as a peaceful nuclear program for many years had an explanation to everything it was doing in the fuel cycle. And even the foreign ministry at that time in 2005, uh, Harazi said that the uh, nuclear uh, plants that we see uh, in uh, Japan could be a very good model for Iran. He said it publicly and explicitly. But no question that in Iran th there were and there are today many people that believe that Iran should have taken the North Korean path and not the Japanese one. In 2016, when, Japan, when North Korea had its first uh, uh, nuclear explosion, uh, the Iranian uh, newspaper close to the, to the leader has uh, endorsed the uh, nuclear exam, the, the North Korean uh, event, saying that it is uh, something that could be relevant also for the Middle East. Um, I would mention in brackets that the uh, head of the Quds Force, the one who has uh, replaced Soleimani, is someone who has been in North Korea mm -hmm. and someone who has, in his tele uh, telegram uh, that is associated with him, uh, is praising the technological and economic achievements of North Korea in spite of sanctions that are, that are on uh, North Korea from the American administration and the international sanctions. So as I said, Iran until today has decided to, to enhance its uh, nuclear project 
in the, the cautious and secure way rather than the quick and risky one. The Iranians understand the difference between Iran and North Korea. North Korea is uh, probably the, one of the most poor countries in the world, the, the, a, a dictatorship that is uh, one of the cruelest in the world, while in Iran, people, even though it is a dictatorship, people are not hesitating to go to the streets to demonstrate. The public opinion is important for the regime, and therefore the regime has to take into account the needs of the public, the economic needs, the employment needs, and others. And therefore, uh, the, uh, sus Iran is much more susceptible to economic pressure than North Korea. And of course, it's, uh, Iran is also benefiting from the fact that Iran, that it has mo most of its own food, it is able to, uh, to produce for its own. And, uh, and today, it's, it also has the opportunity to have cooperation with a lot of countries that decided not to join the American uh, sanctions. Now, since, uh, uh, since uh, North Korea uh, has the um, possibility to, uh, to attack not only Korea, South Korea, but also Japan, and in a way is holding these two countries as a hostage vis-a-vis uh, -vis any American attempt to attack militarily uh, North Korea, it seems that uh, even Iran has, might have, I would say such a possibility by, and it showed in the last in the last year that it is able to attack the uh, uh, the, uh, um, the oil facilities in in Saudi Arabia. It's uh, it's able to attack uh, tankers in the Gulf, and the, of course the U.S. does have a lot of soldiers and navy and air uh, ports in uh, in uh, in Bahrain and in Qatar. So in a way. Uh, Iran has the same ability as North Korea had vis -a -vis, has vis-a-vis -vis its own neighbors. But the, the ability of Iran to conduct such, a, such a, a, an attack without having any nuclear deterrence is very different than the one that North Korea is. And therefore, what we saw is that uh, after the U uh, US invasion to Iraq in 2003, we saw Iran deciding to stop its nuclear, military nuclear project in 2004, 2003, and uh, to uh, open itself to the uh, inspection of the IAEA. My understanding is that as long as the, uh, as the Iranian leadership will believe that there is a credible military threat from the US to the stability of the regime, they will uh, abandon any uh, decision to go and break out to a nuclear, a military nuclear uh, device. But having said that, all that, there is no question the two events that happened in the last, the last uh, couple of, uh, the last five years, I would say, on one hand, the nuclear agreement, the JCPOA, and on the other hand, the uh, policy of Trump today are uh, encouraging the understanding in Iran that nuclear project and the nuclear military capability are good cards for negotiation and the best cards for achieving, achieving economic uh, achievements. And therefore, uh, we can see in both cases, even though they are so different, that the Obama administration was willing to negotiate with Iran their achievements in the nuclear project, and giving them the economic achievements. And Trump today is calling them to come to the negotiating table in order to have a better nuclear agreement to stop their, their, their advance to a nuclear uh, capability, their nuclear capabilities, and, and, uh, and they're promising them a sanctions relief and even more, saying, I'm not against their regime change. I will support you to improve your economy situation. Last point that I want to mention is that since Tehran really thinks that they, at the end of the day, the real end game of, of the U.S. administration is a regime change and not only the nuclear project, they are today much closer to the uh, North Korean example than they were in the past. 
And that's the reason why for the first time I'm uh, raising the possibility that what the Iranians are threatening, that they will leave the NPT, is something that has to be taken into account as a last resort that they can do, uh, taking the example of the first time that North Korea have left the NPT. They had these 90 days that until what they have proclaimed will, take, will, will be taken into a, a, a real uh, action. And they uh, decided to give back and to go back to NPT at the last day. So this is an example that one should take into account that Iran can Im imitate the North Korean example. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sima. Um, I'd like to transition uh, now to Bob. Um, and both, both uh, Sima and Jung sp spoke uh, about uh, North Korea's military transfers and assistance to the Middle East, but maybe you can just elaborate a little bit on how the types and composition of this assistance has evolved over time. Um, they gave examples of some of the customers, but it would be interesting if you have other examples. And um, I think even more interesting, what are the approaches that have been used uh, in an attempt to block North Korean transfers to the region? And to what extent have they been successful? And I really, to, if you can, draw on your personal experience. In the late 90s, you were the US negotiator with North Korea on missiles, and you were in touch closely with, with the Israelis, with Israel. And you also led efforts to pressure other countries in the region to stop buying uh, weapon from the North Koreans. So if you can tell us a little bit about these efforts um, and how successful have they been. Uh, for decades, uh, North Korea has had a desperate need uh, for revenues to sustain its economy, uh, to support its nuclear and uh, missile programs, uh, and to satisfy the material needs of elites to ensure their loyalty. Now, a lucrative way to generate those revenues has been to sell military goods and services. And the most promising markets they found have been in the Middle East and to a lesser extent uh, Africa. Uh, and what, uh, what North Korea has to offer these countries um, is uh, a, a line of military goods, um, not as sophisticated as they could get elsewhere, uh, but relatively inexpensive and reliable. And so this has been a product that's been very attractive uh, in these regions. And the uh, North Koreans have been uh, willing to sell almost anything to almost anyone. Uh, governments, uh, as well as militant, uh, non-state actors, uh, rogue, regi rogue regimes, uh, such as Libya and Iran, uh, as well as friends of the United States, such as uh, Egypt, Pakistan, and the UAE. Uh, it even reached out to Israel uh, in 1992 uh, and 1999 to seek massive financial compensation in exchange for uh, curbing its missile transfers in the Middle East. I don't know if any other speaker has touched on that. It's an interesting episode. Uh, I was in close touch uh, with Israeli officials during that entire period, uh, and uh, perhaps we could go into it, but it was, uh, it, it, it led to nothing, but it was a very interesting episode. So the North has been uh, a supermarket of military assistance uh, with uh, products ranging from training to military, to military advisors, uh, to tunnel construction, to small arms and light weapons, uh, to rockets and missiles of various ranges, uh, to equipment and technology for producing rockets and ballistic missiles. And assistance was not confined uh, to the conventional domain. Uh, North Korea provided equipment and material for the chemical weapons programs uh, of both Syria and Iran. Uh, in the nuclear realm, uh, there are only a few confirmed cases of North Korean transfers. Uh, a canister of North Korean origin uranium gas, that's uranium hexafluoride, uh, presumably in, uh, intended uh, for Gaddafi's planned uh, uranium enrichment program was found in Libya. And of course, North Korea constructed uh, a plutonium uh, production reactor uh, at the Al-Kibar site in, in Syria. And of course, Israel uh, destroyed 
that reactor before it became operational in 2007. Now, a circumstantial case uh, has been made for North Korean nuclear cooperation with Iran, uh, based, for example, on reports that Iranian nuclear scientists have visited the PRK nuclear facilities and even attended a North Korean nuclear weapons test. But to my knowledge, and I, I'd be interested to hear uh, Israeli views, but to my knowledge, uh, the U.S. intelligence community has never been able to confirm uh, Iranian North Korean nuclear cooperation. And Iran's nuclear archive, captured by Israel in 2018, apparently makes no uh, mention of support uh, from Pyongyang. North Korea has been a huge supplier of ballistic missiles, components, materials, and production technology to the Middle East. Uh, among its customers were Iran, Syria, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and the UAE. Iran uh, was by far the largest recipient. Uh, it purchased a full line of North Korean missile products, including the medium range Nodong, renamed the Shahab-3, uh, which Tehran has sought to configure as a possible vehicle for delivering nuclear weapons. Uh, recently, the two countries have been jointly developing an 80-ton rocket engine that could help boost uh, a space launch vehicle uh, or an ICBM. North Korea has also been a key uh, military supplier to Middle East non-state actors, especially Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthis. It has supplied these groups directly as well as indirectly via Iran. For the last 30 years, the United States has sought to stop North Korean military transfers, both to avoid their destabilizing reg regional effects and to deny the North Korean regime the revenues needed to fund its own military programs. It has used various uh, policy tools, and I'll go over a few of them. One approach, has been to reduce the demand for North Korean supplies. The United States uh, approached uh, several countries receiving or planning to receive North Korean supplies and encouraged or pressured them to forego DPRK transfers. In the late 1990s, it persuaded Egypt and the Emirates to uh, uh, not to buy SCUD-related equipment in part by threatening the suspension of certain US military projects with those countries if they decided to go ahead. Libya's demand for uh, DPRK products was suspended in the early 2000s when the United States and Britain exposed Libya's ties to the AQ Khan black market network and forced Gaddafi to abandon his WMD and missile programs. Such uh, demand side approaches can be effective, but their effects may only be temporary as they were in Egypt. In 2017, the Trump administration withheld close to $300 million in military aid to Egypt to pressure it to sever its military cooperation with North Korea. Now this led to further Egyptian pledges of questionable uh, sincerity, uh, I would add, uh, to cut off its military ties with North Korea. Of course, seeking to persuade countries, seeking to persuade customers not to buy North Korea, North Korean uh, goods, uh, has no prospect of success with countries and non-state actors over which the United States has little leverage. Unfortunately, those are among uh, North Korea's best customers. A second policy approach has been to impose sanctions, especially U.S. unilateral sanctions on companies and individuals involved in North Korea's military proliferation activities. But sanction, sanctioning North Korean entities has limited practical effect uh, because they don't rely on the international financial system at least not in their own name. 
they get foreign nationals and companies to operate on their behalf. Sanctioning third party banks, companies and individuals that assist North Korea's illicit marketing and sales efforts can be more effective. But the, both the Obama and Trump administrations have occasionally sanctioned third party entities, but foreign, but foreign policy equities may sometimes make Washington reluctant to impose sanctions against friendly countries or countries like China, where stopping North Korean proliferation competes with other US priorities. Another policy tool is interdictions, relying mostly on intelligence information to intervene either at the transaction or the shipment stage to block illicit transfers. Security Council resolutions provide legal support for interdictions by banning imports of North Korean arms and authorizing UN members to inspect cargoes suspected of containing illicit North Korean goods. The United States and Israel, operating independently or in cooperation, have had notable successes in stopping North Korean transfers to the region or Iranian transfers to its regional partners. But such successes depend on precise, actionable intelligence, which will often be unavailable. A fourth policy tool that has been tried, although without lasting success, is negotiations with North Korea. The United States has been involved in a series of these negotiations. Uh, most negotiations from the 1994 agreed framework uh, to the failed 2019 Hanoi summit conference between Kim Jong-un and President Trump have focused on North Korea's indigenous capabilities, mainly its nuclear capability, not on its exports. Um, so I was, I was saying that progress had been made on the missile uh, export ban, uh, but we're far apart on limiting North Korea's indigenous missile programs when the Clinton administration uh, ran out of time. There's a lot to say about, about that. I was directly involved during that during that period, and we can discuss it uh, later. Um, so today, uh, I'll just sum up. Today, U.S.-North Korean talks uh, have reached a dead end. Um, I'm sure Jung has, has talked about this. Uh, and even if they can be re revived in the future, the likelihood of achieving sound, verifiable agreements uh, is uncertain at, at best, in my view. Uh, taken together, uh, these various policy tools may, uh, to some extent, impede uh, North Korea's missile proliferation activities in the Middle East. But stopping those activities, especially given North Korea's extensive and highly sophisticated illicit proliferation network, is very unlikely. Um, and I do want to talk about, you know, the U.S. policy here is key. Um, what they've been, what they're calling maximum pressure. It uses a sanction strategy to bring uh, North Korea to the negotiation table. And we've heard from, I think, three of you that it's reached a dead end. Um, one key part of that is China, North Korea's number one trading partner, has loosened its enforcement of sanctions. And my question to you is how, in your assessment, the new, or not the new, but the growing rivalry between Washington and Beijing that some people call, call the new Cold War uh, will affect uh, the strategy vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. Um, and uh, we have another question from the audience that maybe I can tie into this, um, asking to what degree, if any, is North Korean activity in the Middle East the directed or assisted um, by China? So on maximum pressure, um, maximum pressure had its origins in 2016 when the Obama administration started to place uh, restrictions on North Korea's exports. And, and uh, North, the North Koreans um, exporting of coal, iron ore, um, textiles and fish, um, I think by uh, at this point uh, far outscale what they do in small arms sales. Um, 
And so, uh, so maximum pressure was designed to, to choke off all of these avenues of regime, uh, the regime's ability to, um, to generate revenue. Um, and uh, we were talking about in terms of in the billions of dollars uh, with these exports. And, and maximum pressure also involved going to uh, all of these different partner countries um, to try to get, the, get, our, get our friends and partners um, to try to uh, put the spotlight on North Korean officials who are wandering around, lurking around these countries. They're not there to, for dip not just diplomacy, but they're there to generate revenue. Um, they have, the North Korean regime has told its officials abroad to make sure that you're, you're making money, um, not just to support the embassies and their, and their stay in those countries, but also for loyalty payments to the regime. Um, so maximum pressure was designed to try to uh, to go at all of the, the ways that North Korea uh, uh, tries to get money to get hard currency. Um, but you know, with the, the unintended effect of the summit what the, is that um, that has reduced maximum pressure. Um, President Trump, as early as 2000, early 2018, said, I don't want to even say maximum pressure anymore. Um, and the, and he has, uh, the president has also admitted that he has held back on, on potentially hundreds of designations of Chinese and North Korean entities um, that are engaged in, uh, uh, in, in uh, evading sanctions. Um, and so, um, so maximum pressure started to erode as uh, almost as quickly as it began. Um, and, uh, and a lot of the things have been, uh, uh, a lot of concessions have been made to, to maintain the mood of diplomacy. For example, a postponement of US exercises with South Korea. Um, but I would say that you know, given uh, the the that you know, China is a huge factor in in that maximum pressure. Um, China, with along with uh, with Russia, since 2019, has openly and very publicly uh, suggested and advocated for a reduction or even a lifting of sanctions. Um, they they, pro uh, they had a draft proposal to the UN on this issue. Um, and so Beijing and Moscow have not been shy about making sure that, they're, that, that the sanctions are reduced for, for North Korea. Um, but you know, China uh, has a lot, you know, given the fact that North Korea is, uh, relies on China for over 90% of its trade, um, uh, you know, the, the fact that China is, is, uh, has little appetite, for, uh, uh, little appetite for cooperating with the US and North Korea issues at this point is a huge, um, is a huge, uh, 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 it, it's not a good thing uh, in terms of trying to get North Korea to give up any part of its nuclear weapons or stopping its export of missiles. Um, I don't see that, uh, you know, in, rather than China facilitating North Korean arms sales in the Middle East, I would say that they would be competing with North Korea uh, in the Middle East on arms sales. Uh, let me stop there. I see that Bob has a, has a two finger. Uh, I don't believe uh, Chinese authorities uh, have an interest in seeing those proliferation activities take place. Uh, I don't think they would actively assist uh, North Korea's marketing of, uh, of this, these military goods and services. Uh, but uh, China has been a, a haven uh, for uh, uh, individuals, North Koreans, other foreign nationals um, operating on North Korea's behalf. Uh, serving as uh, brokers. I mean, there are many North Korean uh, uh, brokers who have been operating in China uh, without much uh, uh, interference uh, by, uh, by Beijing uh, authorities. Uh, small Chinese banks uh, have uh, cooperated uh, with uh, North Korea's proliferation activities, not necessarily knowingly, uh, because North Korea uh, 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 get, gets the support of foreign nationals to serve as fronts for their activities. Uh, so that's been a big problem. China, I don't think, uh, actively supports these activities, uh, but it, China is at fault for its lax attitude toward them. Uh, if China made a real effort to crack down on these illicit uh, activities, uh, uh, you know, in their territory, I think the problem would be on its way to being solved. China's been a, a big part of the problem, but not intentionally. Sima, I wanted to, we just heard that uh, despite the use of uh, similar terminology, maximum pressure, but now 
uh, it has changed. You can call it uh, maybe maximum pressure uh, still vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea, but there is a maximum pressure stra strategy employed uh, toward Iran. Um, it seems, and maybe you can speak about that, that it, in either case, so far, the strategies have worked very well to change the behaviors of the regimes. And maybe you can speak a little bit about the differences in the maximum pressure strategies, uh, what it has achieved and what it hasn't in Iran. Um, and this may be, I'd, I'd love uh, the opinions of our other panelists, if not maximum pressure, then what? Yeah, I, I think the uh, issue of uh, maximum pressure on Iran, uh, when we use this term, we, we, uh, we relate to the years of Trump. But we have to remember that this uh, strategy started also within the days of uh, the Obama administration, combining the uh, pressure on economic uh, Iranian economic rela uh, trade, the uh, relations with the outside uh, world, the SWIFT system of transfer of money, etc., uh, as a tool to bring Iran to negotiation and to compromise. So uh, uh, this, this uh, understanding of the need of the regime to have, uh, to have economic achievements vis-a-vis -vis his own people was understood also in the, during the years of Obama. And it seemed, I don't know if this is the only reason, but it seemed that the Iranians came to the negotiating table with the uh, Obama administration in 2013 and then concluded the, uh, the uh, nuclear, the JCPOA in 2015 because of their uh, willingness to try this uh, uh, channel of negotiation as a way to relief, uh, to get a relief of sanctions and to start again to bring all their money that was frozen outside of Iran and to start exporting oil in the in the numbers and in the that they have done before the sanctions. So this uh, uh, system of connecting between economic pressure and uh, a compromise on the nuclear uh, project was already used and was the uh, background for the JCPOA uh, agreement. Now, when, it, when we come to, uh, to the Trump administration, he decided in May 2018 to leave the agreement uh, and not to be any more part of them and immediately to bring back the sanctions. Uh, now, the difference now is that on one hand, it is much more effective from the point of view of what the U.S. is doing in order to make sure that Iran does not have connection to any company, any bank, any security, any, uh, any uh, uh, entity that has its own interest in the U.S. But at the same time, and it is different from what was during the Obama administration times, the other parties in the world, is it the Europeans or Russia or China, are not part of this uh, agreement on sanctions. Now, of course, the American economy is such an important one that no one in the world that has any interest in the U.S. would dare to do a uh, business with Iran. So from that point of view, the U.S. alone can put a lot of pressure on, the, on Iran. But that's not enough. The Iranians are finding ways to sell, uh, to sell oil, not in big numbers, of course, in lesser and lesser than it was uh, years ago uh, without the sanctions. But still, they have the, the, their ways to trade with other countries, with other small companies. And it is uh, different from what it was before. Now. Is it enough? No. For, for two years, uh, we are now in May 2020, uh, 2020 uh, and uh, there, we are celebrating, in brackets, uh, two years for sanctions. Iran did not decide to come to negotiations. And our estimation is that until the elections in the U.S., they will not go to any compromise with the Trump administration. They will have to calculate, of course, after the elections, I, whether it is the uh, second term of Trump or it is a new uh, minister, a new president, uh, that could be uh, that would be a very important uh, element in their cal calculation of how to promote or not promote any uh, negotiations with the Americans. But as long, uh, for the time being, there is a huge suffering uh, uh, in Iran, a huge uh, nuclear, a new huge uh, economic. Uh, 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 huge economic difficulties um, and the situation is worse than it was before but it didn't bring the ultimate goal 
did bring Iran to negotiate a new agreement, a better agreement. And therefore, uh, the question, as you have put it, Shira, is uh, what are the other tools that Iran, that the U.S. can use vis-à-vis -vis Iran? Uh, I must say that they are limited. Uh, the, the U.S. does not have an alternative strategy vis-à-vis -vis Iran. It's more and more uh, pressure, uh, which might, at the end of the day, after a period of time, might be such a damaging to Iran that they, they will decide to come to negotiation, but it didn't happen till now. Uh, and the only, the only uh, thing that is missed now, and I don't think will be there on the table, is a credible military option if Iran uh, passes any uh, kind of, uh, I would call it red lines, even if they are not uh, determined as red lines uh, in its nuclear project. Uh, Trump administration, as far as we understand it, doesn't have any interest in getting into wars in the Middle East. On the contrary, he wants to get out of the Middle East. And Iran also understands it. So as long as there will be no credible military option, only the economic uh, pressure, I think, will not be enough. Thank you, Sima. Um... Bob Jung, if you uh, want to um, add to that, sort of beyond maximum pressure, where are we heading? Um, you know, I just wanted to make an observation um, that I thought was interesting when when um, Sima was speaking about the you know whether Iran will take the Japan model or the North Korea model. I thought um, that was an interesting framing of what kind of path Iran would take. I mean, it occurs to me that what's different about Iran and North Korea is that uh, what I think one of the main differences and one of the key differences, um, as uh, Seema has pointed out, um, and I would add this, um, and it's that uh, Iran doesn't see nuclear weapons, as far as I can tell, um, as a part of its identity or its brand. Uh, whereas North Korea, the Kim Jong-un regime himself um, is has made has been at pains to uh, incorporate nuclear weapons into its concept, into its legal framework, into its culture, into its songs, into the all of the crevices of, of national life uh, that uh, has, it has been infused with the nuclear weapons program. And so, it, from my perspective, that makes that that makes the North Korea uh, part much more difficult to rest. To, to denuclearize North Korea, um, given the fact that nuclear weapons are such a big part of Kim's personal brand, but also its national, the, the country's national identity, and I don't see that happening with Iran. Although I take uh, Seema's point that that because of some of the policies um, of the Trump administration over the past three years, that 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 uh, Iran might be even more defining itself. Um, as a nuclear power or try, or that they're closer to that uh, North Korean model. So I find that to be a fascinating look at how different, um, different regimes look at nuclear weapons. Uh, Iran uh, clearly had a nuclear weapons program that's well documented. Uh, I think though uh, in 2003, uh, they, they decided to defer a decision about whether they wanted to take this nuclear weapons development program uh, to fruition. Uh, I think that's where they are today. It's They've deferred it. They've insisted on keeping their nuclear weapons option open. Uh, they will insist on keeping that option open. That's why they are not going to eliminate their enrichment program, uh, which is an embryonic uh, nuclear weapons program. They will, they will absolutely insist on that. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think we have the ability to shape uh, Iran's perceptions of its national interest and to discourage them from moving uh, to, uh, to weaponize uh, their, uh, their nuclear program. Let me say something about maximum pressure. Uh, maximum pressure is absolutely essential uh, if we want to negotiate acceptable resolutions uh, on either Iran or North Korea. But it's only one part of the problem. Uh, maximum pressure has to be linked uh, to a realistic negotiating position if we want to achieve anything. Uh, I think Iran is under great duress now, and now added to it is the pandemic and the low oil prices and all the rest of it. Uh, but uh, Iran uh, is not going to you know, give up its nuclear weapons option altogether. 
Uh, and the Trump administration has adopted, I think, a very unrealistic uh, maximal approach to negotiating objectives, which, which, which and, and these objectives, these requirements are things that no Iranian government could accept. And we have a similar situation with North Korea. North Korea is under great pressure, less pressure uh, than Iran, perhaps, because it has, it, it has a very successful sanctions evasion plan and it has those who will cooperate with it. Uh, but it's, it's under great, it, it, it is under great pressure. But the Trump administration's approach initially was early and complete denuclearization. Uh, for, uh, for reasons that Jung probably explained that I didn't hear, unfortunately, uh, Kim Jong-un has no intention of giving up his nuclear weapons capability. Uh, it's essential, he believes, to the survival of his regime. Uh, and uh, as long as the Trump administration held to this maximalist position of complete denuclearization, it was not going to succeed. Uh, I think uh, subsequent to the Hanoi summit and in working level talks in Stockholm in the fall of last year, I think the administration adopted a more realistic step-by-step -step approach. But by that time, uh, I think uh, North Korea has lost interest. Kim Jong-un has said he's no longer interested in negotiations uh, with the United States. And I think at this point, North Korea is waiting, waiting out 2020. Uh, and we'll wait to the uh, November presidential election before deciding what to do. The only issue uh, really is uh, how provocative it will be. Uh, it says it's no longer bound by its moratorium on nuclear weapons testing and ICBM uh, testing, uh, and it's now proceeded in a carefully calibrated way only on short range missiles uh, in the hope of not alienating uh, Russia and China and not uh, being too provocative and eliciting a firm U.S. response from the United States. Uh, but I think prospects for negotiation either on Iran or North Korea are essentially nil for the remainder of this year. Thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes before I'll transition to um, Amos Yadlin. Uh, we have a few audience questions. Uh, Sima, this one I think is in particular for you, but also for Zhang. Uh, Bob in his presentation was skeptical of the possibility of ongoing North Korean and Iranian cooperation on nuclear matters. And uh, we have an, uh, someone in the audience that's curious to hear if you agree with that assessment. Thank you. Um, I, I think there is, uh, first of all, we don't have, and I agree completely with what Bob has said, we don't have uh, any confirmation, best good confirmation, to suggest that uh, there is a cooperation, a real cooperation between uh, Iran and North Korea on the nuclear uh, uh, project. Now, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, inform the information that was uh, that I also referred to that the uh, Iranians were participating in tests and uh, nuclear tests that were uh, have been done in, in North Korea. Um, I don't know if it's correct. We, uh, as far as I know, there is no confirmation to this uh, to this uh, uh, information. And I think uh, you know, in, in uh, following Iranian behavior, I would uh, think that the Iranians will be very hesitant to be seen in any way cooperating with North Korea on the nuclear issue. Because everybody knows North Korea has a, mili a nuclear devices, a military nuclear project. Iran is trying to, to uh, present itself as a country that uh, didn't have, uh, will not have uh, any uh, nuclear, military nuclear uh, ambitious, only uh, peaceful, uh, uh, peaceful nuclear projects. So I think this uh, combination with North Korea on this issue uh, is quite, uh, could be quite harming for the Iranians, and I think they will be hesitant uh, to do it. Uh, that doesn't mean that they are not trying, if there is something that they need, something specific that they need, uh, any material specific or something that they can smuggle from North Korea, I assume they will do it. But uh, otherwise, they will be very hesitant. Uh, thank you, Seaman. Before we transition uh, uh, back, just a quick question. We have uh, audience members that are very curious about intelligence capabilities. Um, from what you can say, to what extent does Israel uh, follow North Korea? Um, I, I would say that um, one, uh, one sentence about that, that Israel is follow, following very, very deeply uh, Iran. So if North Korea is doing something with Iran, probably from that angle we will know what is happening there. 
Um, thank you, Sima. And we have a, a, a similar question also to our uh, uh, to Jung and, and Bob. Um, to the extent that you can you can tell us uh, what are the Western the U.S. intelligence capabilities uh, in North Korea. Um, and there's another question that, uh, speaking about new tools and technologies, um, a few months ago, the U.S. government had come down hard on two Chinese nationals uh, for allegedly conspiring with uh, North Korean state-sponsored hackers uh, to steal millions of dollars worth of digital money from cryptocurrency exchanges. And um, uh, if you think uh, there's a possibility North Korea is trying to disguise its activities in the region, in the Middle East, using uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, just briefly on uh, on the uh, on um, Intel efforts on North Korea. You know, North Korea is one of the hardest targets and one of the hard targets that 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 uh, that the U.S. government focuses on. Iran is the other one, um, and so there is a great deal of attention and resources devoted to these targets, especially given their uh, given North Korea's nuclear weapons program and Iran's ambitions and the and the potential for uh, destabilizing activities um, in in both regions. Um, and I, you know, I think what Seema has said, you know, really resonates with me that that Israel um, is very much focused on Iran, and it really underscores the the absolute critical importance of the U.S. having allies and partners all around the world, um, and to maintain those relationships and maintain those networks, so that you, because we're stronger together um, in terms whether it's collection capabilities or an analysis, um, and I think that is really a, a critical. Um, a role that um, that our partners uh, make, um, along with the U.S. Um, government agencies, in in targeting these uh, targeting our adversaries. Bob, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add to that. Uh, not really. We have uh, we have three uh, uh, excellent uh, intelligence analysts, former intelligence analysts here. Uh, Jung, Sima, and Amos, whom we haven't heard from yet, you know, uh, uh, was involved in Israeli intelligence. So I'll leave it to them. Um, great. We'll transition to Amos uh, in one second. I just want to ask one quick question uh, to Jung. Uh, you didn't speak about it here today, but in your article and uh, presumably in your book, you do uh, discuss the importance of uh, restoring uh, the position of human rights special envoy to North Korea. Uh, which the Trump administration uh, uh, canceled in 2017. And if you can just tell us why you think this, this is uh, important and what are the prospects for storing this position? Yeah, um, what, uh, so I, I do mention that in the book and, that's, uh, and the human rights component was a big aspect of my, a component of my article in Foreign Affairs, but it's also a big part of uh, the book, um, uh, Becoming Kim Jong-un, um, that was released, um, that, it was on sale um, as of April, um, and I and I believe that you know we we do ourselves a disservice by relegating or marginalizing the human rights issue as something that's supplemental or something that is uh, something that is not uh, necessary or critical to the nuclear mission or the national security mission. At least in the North Korea uh, on the North Korea issue, human rights is absolutely needs to be a part of. Uh, our pressure campaign. Um, you know, the North Korean government um, has a, a network of uh, gulags, prison camps, um, labor camps designed to uh, repress the people, designed to make sure that fear is a part of the culture. Um, and I think we're not going to get anywhere on, on inspections or verification or on denuclearization if the regime continues to, if the regime does not loosen its restrictions on its people. How do we talk to nuclear scientists in North Korea? How do we talk to uh, North Koreans um, themselves about uh, various uh, North Korean capabilities to verify anything? Um, so I think uh, human rights has to be a part of our, our work on, uh, on North Korea. Uh, not, because it, it, the, not because of the nuclear imperative, but also because it's the right thing to do. Thank you, uh, Jung, Bob, and Seema for an el eliminating discussion. I'd like to hand it back to, uh, to INSS Executive Director, Major General Amos Yadlin for some uh, closing rem remarks. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm very glad that this uh, round table or square table <laughs> uh, of uh, two uh, very respected uh, think tanks. 
the Brookings and INSS is looking today at uh, the story of North Korea role in the Middle East. And the most interesting issue about it is that we don't know everything. A lot is still uh, under the cover of the ways that North Korea is behaving and operate in a very secret, concealing way. But we can go uh, into the history and remember that North uh, Korea uh, sent squadrons of MiG-21 even uh, 50 years ago. In 1973, uh, they had a squadron in Egypt. Uh, by the way, uh, December, after the war, uh, December 6, I think, uh, two North Korean MiGs were uh, shut down by an Israeli Air Force, uh, Phantom F-4, and maybe by uh, an Egyptian SAM missile that had some friendly uh, attack on their North Korean help. But I want to go to the strategic level. And the strategic level of North Korea is affecting the Middle East, sometimes by hardware, but not less by ideological and doctrine and concepts. And North Korea basically, uh, first of all, is ideological enemy of the West, of the United States, uh, and it was on the other side to uh, Israel and the United States during the Cold War. And then after uh, the Cold War was over, they choose the side of the rogue states, uh, Iran, Syria, Libya, and others. So ideology against the US is a leading, uh, a leading pillar in the uh, North Korean activity in the Middle East. Second, and this is more on uh, the defense military side, asymmetrical approach. The North Korean was the weak side against the superpower. So they have developed artillery vis-a-vis -vis Seoul, and then huge army, and then a threat on the civilian population. They are not playing with the same uh, rules of engagement. They are not accepting uh, uh, the just war uh, theory. Then by tunneling, then rockets, terror, and the cherry on the cream is uh, WMD. So asymmetrical uh, approach leading to another pillar, which is deterrence. And by asymmetrical tools, you deter the stronger uh, power that you are facing. And once again, it started in Seoul, then Japan, then continental United States. So extended range of their deterrence and much more uh, powerful uh, tools. And then we come to the Middle East, uh, proliferation without limitations. Anything you can proliferate, you do. Starting with rockets and airplanes and then missiles, technology and then missiles themselves. And at the end, once again, uh, chemical and nuclear uh, weapons. So let me uh, uh, speak a little bit about uh, what Shira asked me to speak. And this is the lessons from 2007, when North Korea delivered, as Sima said, Terran key project to Syria. And this is the difference between Syria and Iran. Because Syria didn't have any nuclear scientific and uh, industrial capabilities. So the idea that Syria is developing nuclear weapon uh, seems to be uh, something out of the blue, which is not 
exist in the early uh, 2000, and nobody predicted that they will uh, buy secretly uh, a nuclear weapon. Because after the 1981 destroying of the Iraqi nuclear reactor, nobody thought about the plutonium track as something that they can do covertly. Centrifuges, somewhere in the basement or in a tunnel, yes. But nuclear? And here comes the North Korean way of concealing, cheating, uh, find innovative way how to pro proliferate their uh, nuclear uh, uh, program. And the way of concealing it was by avoiding any signals of what they are doing. No air defense around, not even a fence, a mechanical fence on the ground. Seems like an innocent agricultural uh, facility, warehouse. And the idea to build a nuclear reactor under a civilian uh, a building, industrial building, was a North Korean uh, very innovative idea. The, the fact that the U.S. and Israel missed it for a couple of years has to do with how we share the war. Israel is looking very carefully at Syria, and the U.S. is responsible to look at North Korea. And nobody on both sides of the ocean was able to do the connection that was there until we finally found it. It was a big surprise to the American intelligence. And as chief of intelligence at that time, when we shared it with the Americans, there were three questions that they asked. Are you sure it's a military nuclear reactor? And we had very good evidence to convince them, and they agreed. What is the time that it will be operational? Uh, which was very important to the uh, question of what you are doing about it. And then what will be the consequences of uh, an Israeli or American decision to destroy it? Uh, we share the intelligence, we agreed about the intelligence, but when you agree about the intelligence, you don't under, always agree on policy. And Prime Minister at that time, uh, Ehud Olmert, uh, being uh, less than a year after the uh, Second Lebanese War, uh, didn't want Israel to go to another war because of uh, the need to destroy this nuclear reactor. And he asked the Americans to do and surprisingly enough, when President Bush called his advisors, nobody supported that America will attack another Arab Muslim country after Afghanistan and Iraq. And at that time, suspicion in intelligence in America was very high, even though the intelligence approved what we have brought. Uh, and then Israel decided to do, to do it. And the goal, the policy goal, was no core, no war. How to destroy the nuclear reactor without uh, destroying, uh, without uh, deteriorating into, uh, into a war. The next uh, issue, and this is beyond 2007, was the question that was asked here in the panel, what about uh, a, similar, a similar project in Iran? Syria is close. Syria is not a huge territory. It's a small to a medium country. And Israel is covering it very well. Iran is huge. Iran is far away. And the fact that even after 13 years, the conventional wisdom is that there is no cooperation uh, between Iran and North Korea on the nuclear issue. Every head of intelligence have to assume that he is not seeing it 
but it is there. They must continue to uh, look for it. The conventional wisdom is that Iran don't, doesn't need North Korea. Because very much like in ballistic missiles, they have learned the basic, the fundamentals, uh, 10, 20 years ago from Iran, uh, from North Korea. But now the student is not less capable than the old professor. Uh, I would like to suggest that it's, uh, it's, a, it's a must to continue and look uh, to cooperation between Iran and North Korea because it is so natural, politically, geopolitically. North Korea, in a way, is a model for Iran. How to achieve deterrence against the US, how to behave uh, in all their rogue uh, behavior without being punished. And they really want to achieve the North Korean capabilities without paying the North Korean price. Because Iran is much more dependent on their international uh, uh, relation and trade and education and they don't want to be isolated the way North Korea is isolated. But it's all the time uh, considered in Iran how much they are willing to pay to be the North Korea of uh, the Middle East. And for us, and I will uh, end with that, it is very important to learn the lesson from how North Korea uh, achieved their nuclear capabilities, how the West, led by the US, was unable to stop them, unable to uh, even uh, freeze them, or, uh, and how they reach a, 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 the possibility and the capability uh, to threaten continental US with nuclear weapons and not to, to, to do the same mistakes or to, to learn the lesson how to do it differently vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Iran, whether in negotiation or in any uh, operational uh, strategy. I want to finish with uh, thanking uh, you, Shira, uh, for handling this uh, uh, very interesting and I think uh, educational uh, panel. Uh, my old friend Bob Heinoren, uh, my colleague Sima, uh, Dr. Park, and everybody who helped uh, make this event uh, so successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.